like to welcome you all this evening to what we are calling a both a memorial and a celebration of the life of uh, a professor who was who will be missed very much here at Pratt, and that was uh, Professor Mimi LaBelle. I, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm the dean of the school, and the reason I'm doing that is because uh, my name is Tom Hanrahan, and I'm the dean of the school. And the reason I do that is because I've noticed that so many people have come here who have graduated uh, from Pratt probably before my time. I've been here five years, and I'm, I'm at once startled, but I guess I probably shouldn't be surprised because of the kind of person Mimi was. Um, and it's wonderful to see all of you return. It's, it's, it's great to have you, and I think it says something very much about Pratt and more importantly says something very much about Mimi. Um, Mimi was a, was a very unique uh, faculty member and person as in fact probably all of our faculty are. I think um, it's very true that an architecture school or any school I suppose if, if want to generalize is really any school is defined by its faculty it's it's they're the special people who make the school what it is um, and as faculty uh, retire or as they pass away and Mimi was taken from us uh, at a very early age before her time so to speak uh, the school changes and evolves, and it will change and evolve again. So what we're really, I think, remembering here tonight is Mimi and the role and the importance that she played in defining Pratt as an institution and the School of Architecture as an institution. Um, she was, she came to Pratt, I think, at a, a critical time, if, if, if I could even discuss what Mimi represented a, a kind of critical time and a, and, a, and a changing time, both in our society and in the School of Architecture. She was only the second woman, as you noted in the notes, to be uh, tenured as a full-time professor here. The first was Sybil maholi Naj, and, uh, and Mimi was the second, a, a very, I think a very, I think that signified something very important, both for Pratt as an evolving institution but also for the profession of architecture. There weren't many architects who uh, were women. So Mimi kind of led the way, I think, both in the profession and at Pratt, and she continued to do so the entire time she was here. Um, I knew Mimi during my time here, certainly not as long as many people who taught with her over the years, and, and of course, uh, of course, John LaBelle, who survives her, 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 her husband and, uh, and fellow professor here at the school. Um, but I did get to know her through the work of her students, which was always very exciting. And if one thing strikes me about Mimi and the, and the importance to the school, is that she always stressed the importance of each student. And the, the work in the studio was always very unique. Um, we'll probably hear about her interests in mythology, in, uh, in non-Western cultures, in history, sort of outside the canons and the norms of, of how history has traditionally been taught. And again, I think that's part of her unique contribution and, 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 the, and the change and the, and the important thing and the importance of her point of view that, that, uh, that she brought to the school. And she stressed imagination and creativity in the design process. And I think her students appreciated it. I think they, they did incredible work with Mimi. And I think the simplest thing I could say is that Mimi, uh, I think students loved Mimi and I think she loved them back. And I think that's probably why so many of you are here this evening. Um, 
so I think we should remember Mimi, and I think uh, we should remember what she was and what she meant to the school. And now I'd like to introduce, introduce Anthony Caradona, who is currently the chair of our department uh, of undergraduate architecture, and will speak as someone who knew Mimi as a colleague, but also, I think, as a student. So. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as I saw the faces and people walking in today, I imagine that everybody remembers Mimi Lobel uh, in their own way, certainly from my inter interchange with people and discussions with people throughout the 20 years since I came to Pratt, or maybe more. Uh, people have told me about different aspects of Mimi's life through the times that they knew them, even people outside of Pratt, and I'm sure each of us has our own special section or slice or moment of Mimi in, in our inter interaction with her, and mine was as a student, <coughs> uh, as pr probably not everybody knows, but I was a student at Pratt, and I believe the first or second year when I was at Pratt, I think that was the year that Mimi received tenure, first time it was, she was quite happy about that. Um, but I remember more than that, the events, I remember what Mimi left with me, the impression that she gave as a teacher, and uh, it was always the one thing that stuck with me was, was her sense of the newness of discovery, that through whatever she taught, whether it was history or design, and I actually was a student of hers in her history courses, as well as her non-Western course, which was her first uh, course outside of the regular history survey that she gave and, and invented in a way, uh, was that no matter how she discussed a different culture, a time in architecture, it, she always made it seem as though there was something to discover and that each of us could discover something in the way we, we, we specifically approached that topic or that era or that culture. And uh, so I was very inspired after being in her course in the history survey with she and John and other faculty uh, to take her again. And I took her uh, as an upper level student. I was enrolled in her uh, non-Western course, which in a way, she was a trailblazer at, for her time. I, I didn't know this at the time until afterwards in my graduate studies. And realizing that she was one of only two or maybe three people in the country and maybe only two people Within the, New York, within the New York City area who were dealing with this notion of you know, non-Western culture, culture outside of the canons of Greek and Roman and European history and how that influenced architecture, but was looking actually at a, a worldview of how architecture is defined by its people and, uh, and frames the life of peoples around the world uh, and the different worldviews that those are sort of sparked from. Uh, so she was a trailblazer. Was actually, I think we can maybe attribute John Haydick as another person who began to bring in uh, cultures and other disciplines outside of architecture into architecture. But Mimi, I think, was one of the first, if not the first, uh, at least on the East Coast, who began to talk about non-Western architecture. And in fact, eventually that became one of the requirements that the NAAB gave as part of the requirements for architecture schools. So as a trailblazer, she actually had a very specific interest in the intersection between uh, the psychology of human beings, the culture uh, in general of human beings, and architecture. And that intersection, she really looked at very specifically in her um, special topic in that course, which eventually I think John will begin to complete a book that she began many, many years ago on spatial archetypes. And uh, she had a very poignant way of diagramming, a, 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 a using a diagram to sort of uh, begin to trigger the ideas that connect back to architecture. And she really had a very keen sense about how to take the work of mythologists and architects and historians and archaeologists and sociologists and bring them down into a sort of fulcrum that we could all begin to delve into into the class. And all I can remember is sitting in, in class and every time I'm sure Mimi had given the same lecture many, many times, it always seemed like it was the first time she was giving that lecture because she was so excited, so passionate, and so you know, deeply personally involved with the topic when, when, she, when she brought it up in the lectures. And she really I always remember that whenever she thought something was unique, she would say as if it was something she was just aware of the first time. She'd laugh, and, you know, laugh as if to say, isn't this wonderful? And I think that's what I remember Mimi, uh, how I remember Mimi the best. I never, uh, I never was enrolled in her design studios at the time. I think she was teaching at another level, and I never got the opportunity. But I, as chair and as, uh, as chair for the past at least four or five, five years, it was uh, certainly Mimi Studios and the way she brought this kind of sense of culture and sense of discovery and a sort of mission for students to sort of be able to explore and find themselves and find their own culture within and through architecture and find architecture through that process. 
uh, Mimi was unique uh, among all faculty, I think, because she really dealt with the students' individual interests and individual background as a sort of uh, research project for themselves so that they could find their way to themselves and to architecture. And I think that's what she brought to the school, and I think uh, we will all remember her that way. Uh, and I feel sort of saddest for the students who won't uh, be able to uh, know her, meet her, and be her students, because she certainly added a layer to our school, our culture, and certainly to me as an individual, as an architect, and as an educator. Thank you. The next presenter is uh, the president of our faculty, who uh, was actually Mimi's colleague for many, many years, uh, our, one of our full-time professors, Professor Theo David. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, Tom. Um, I really don't want to speak as faculty president. That's, that's fleeting. It doesn't mean anything. Um, I want to speak as a colleague, both uh, here at Pratt and also as a colleague and as a member of the architectural profession. Um, you know, words, expressions, terms are not defined by dictionaries. Hmm? They're defined really by the actions of human beings. And certainly the word courage was sadly d defined by the people that participated in trying to save us last week. Mimi LaBelle gave definition to the word devotion. Because when I think of Mimi, and I've known her since she came to Pratt, I was here a couple of years before her. She came in 72, she came a little bit, a couple of years before. Um, other than the fact that, as has already been mentioned, she opened up my eyes and the eyes of many students to things that we weren't discussing, hmm? which were cultures beyond our own that we knew that we were trained on. Okay? She really refocused us in terms of what is important and why we are here, which sometimes we pay lip service to, but we are here because of our students and for our students. And she always reminded us of that. Hmm? She was a talented designer, and yet she chose to devote her abilities, her creativity, to Pratt Institute. But in particular to the students of the School of Architecture at Pratt Institute. She put that foremost above everything. That's unusual. She made no excuses about it. We were very, very lucky that her full energy, as we could perceive, was focused on, first of all, looking at each individual. And I saw it in action, because I had the pleasure, the honor, if you will, of being invited to her jury sometimes. Of she would look at each student in her class and try to understand their individual backgrounds try to respect them as human beings first, because she knew that to show respect and devotion to the student as an individual was the way of unlocking their creativity. So once that was done, then she infused them with knowledge and ways of looking at architecture that the rest of us were hardly aware of, as has been mentioned, non-Western architecture, a different uh, uh, the, 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 the cult of the goddess, of, of mythology, and so on and so forth. These were new things that 20 years ago, whatever it's been, people really weren't talking very much about. And that was incredible. So her devotion to her students really came about as a result of her, first of all, understanding them, respecting them as individuals, as human beings, which was a way of unlocking of their opening up their hearts to her, and in so doing, allowing her to enter with her full creative powers into their educational, into their creative process. It was quite wonderful. We're very lucky, 
as I can see here, that she has uh, asked or that she is leaving her archives, mm -hmm. her records, her work to the school, to Pratt Institute and to the School of Architecture. We're lucky because, you know, let's face it, that's what will give her, uh, that's, she'll always be here. That's kind of great. And I'm glad that the school, the institute, has a way of receiving this information, receiving this life's work, and therefore allowing her to continue teaching. Because at the end of the day, as has been mentioned, people come and go. We retire, we die, we move on, we do what we're going to do. Okay? But what is most important is that we leave something behind. But it's equally important that there is the infrastructure, mm -hmm. that there is the institution, that there is the will to receive that which is left behind and to make it available to everyone that an individual has left behind and who unfortunately perhaps could not touch. So we are very, very grateful, John, to Mimi for giving us this great, this great, very great gift. Just on a bit of a lighter note, she was always a wonderful, radiant presence within the School of Architecture. And I think the radiance was a visual one. It was great. And now I understand why, as it says in the notes here, that she used to make her own clothes. And that was kind of great. I didn't know that. And I always wondered why she looked so damn good, John. Mm -hmm. It was like this burst of sunlight, if you will, always moving through, through the halls, up and down the stairs, and so on. Now I understand. Thank you for letting us know about that. So if I may, John, on behalf of the entire faculty of the School of Architecture, to thank you for Mimi and to express once more our condolences. My name is William Chickering. I currently serve Pratt as Dean of Libraries. I'm very pleased to see so many familiar faces out there. Um, when I came to Pratt 20 years ago, Mimi was one of the first people who really made me feel welcome and at home here. She also gave me a sense, uh, to some extent, of what the task was that I had come here to complete. She was uh, a very great lover of books and their content, and I had come to work with multimedia services. She was very enthusiastic in supporting this new uh, department at Pratt by telling us what she needed to do her teaching. And this was wonderful to have a sort of a roadmap and a blueprint to get going. Well, Mimi continued to devote her enormous energies to her students here at Pratt and to putting them in touch with books. She was a voracious collector, but not for some of the reasons that many of us collect whatever it is we collect to enjoy those things ourselves. And she certainly did enjoy the many, many, many books she collected. But her greatest joy was connecting her students to these books, lending her personal copies of a great many wonderful, wonderful volumes to her students and watching them grow and have their, their horizons broadened by ideas that had not occurred to them before, with which they've not come into contact. Well, we have a wonderful opportunity now to continue that kind of work that Mimi made a major part of her life's work. Uh, John has made sure that some of Mimi's wishes in terms of these materials were honored by uh, giving the largest proportion of this collection to the library at Pratt Institute. And so this means that these materials will be available to many, many more generations of students and faculty who will uh, grow from the kinds of, of uh, teaching that Mimi did. Because it turns out that choosing a collection of books uh, is a kind of shaping, and making those available is a kind of shaping of ideas. Um, we have an opportunity to continue that work in a couple of different ways. We have been encouraged to develop an endowment fund. Um, 
which will be called the Mimi Lobel Memorial Collection Endowment Fund, so that we can continue to acquire additional materials that focus on non-Western architecture and the spiritual traditions and mythological traditions that inform uh, much of the world's architecture and concepts that were very, very dear to Mimi's heart. So we're very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I know that you all will miss Mimi as much as I and my colleagues do. Um, so I think the next thing I'm supposed to do is say that now is a time for John to share something of Mimi's life and career with us uh, through a slideshow. Thank you. a little quote from Mimi in the um, flyer that you have and it says learn your trade be yourself and befriend your shadow <clears throat> I think uh, Pratt has a slogan be true to your work and your work will be true to you something like that and I think Mimi takes it one step further in the remark befriend your shadow and so that uh, she had a, a very strong sense of the fullness of oneself, including depth psychology, and then engaging and bringing all of that self into one's work. And, and that's something she encouraged her students to do. Okay, and so I'm going to uh, do a little um, biography of Mimi here, and it's going to be, um, very thorough to find out a lot about her and just the way she would have encouraged each of her students uh, uh, to find out a lot about themselves in order to bring that into their work. I'm going to start with a couple of thoughts. One is we just had this experience with the World Trade Center and Mimi was an avid uh, news uh, follower and she would have been, I'm sure, you know, three days straight of just watching TV uh, about that. Uh, I remember when Grace Kelly's funeral took place. I got up around 6 in the morning. She had been up all night because of the European time. The funeral was going on all night. And she said, my God, the Catholics are just like the Buddhists. In Protestantism, the funeral is for the, those surviving. In Catholicism and Buddhism, it's to guide the soul through the various stages that it will be going through in its, uh, in its movement to next stages. Um, when Mimi died, I called her, uh, her friend, her monk, Loeb Sang, so that he could pray for her to get a good, thanks, a good uh, reincarnation. I also recall that just in the past week, Steve Eisenhower, a classmate of both mine and Mimi's, uh, just died. He was an associate in Venturi's office and um, co-author of Learning from Las Vegas. And it's, I sort of have a feeling of when I, I was down for his memorial and I told Bob Venturi that Mimi had died, and he said, my God, what's going on? And so that, this feeling of a passing of a generation, because Pauline Kael just died, and she show, she, Pauline Kael so much identified the, um, uh, the way that popular culture was fully engaged in, uh, in our psyches, in the way movies were in the 60s and 70s, and unfortunately no longer, no longer are. I just want to say a brief word on how Mimi died. Um, uh, people said, gee, I didn't know that uh, it was that serious. And well, we didn't either. That's why you didn't know. She had, um, she had some bleeding and went to the gynecologist. And he says, well, you probably need a hysterectomy. We'll do some tests. And so she knew for about a month that she had a problem, might have to do something. And then all of a sudden, things got serious. And she knew for about a week 
that she was in trouble and then she was dead. So um, it was uh, quite a shock to um, all of us, including her students who would, well, she might have to take a week off for, you know, how long is she gonna take off for this, to be in a hospital and then all of a sudden she was gone. So it happened um, very quickly um, for all of us. Uh, I want to talk about a lot of material here. I also have some of, Mimi had a lot of stuff. <laughs> Just a little bit of it's right there. So if anybody wants to look at that and, and either something I say or something you see there, you want to ask me now, what was that about? Uh, please feel uh, free to do so. I want to start with Mimi as a little girl. She used to sit on the slide that her father had made for her in the backyard, and she could see over the hedge a mobile gas sign. And she would dream of uh, flying away with Pegasus to lands of adventure and mythology. And the wonderful thing about her life is that's exactly what she did. Um, she was in Ireland, Germany, um, Russia, Bali, India, Dharamsala, uh, on and on and on. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it just, when she was in a little bit better shape, I mean, she was charged up the pyramids, Burbador, uh, the Castillo in Mexico, um, et cetera. And here she is just a few years ago uh, in India. And she became um, uh, a very good um, uh, acquaintance of Joseph Campbell's, went to all of his seminars and began to absorb his approach to mythology into her architecture and became herself uh, a student of all the world's mythologies in a quite seriously scholarly way. She really knew this stuff. She grew up in big sky country of Indiana and Illinois. Um, I recall uh, some student said to me just last semester after she died, she says, no, I, I grew up in, in Indiana in farm country and Mimi was like so, spoke to me and was nice to me just like, and I said, well, that's because she grew up in farm country in Indiana. Um, and her father had a victory garden as uh, people did in those days. And so she grew up in this uh, a very spacious uh, situation. She used to sit uh, when she was older, this is not those drawings a little bit later, but she'd sit in front of TV as a little girl and draw house plants. And um, I love to see the way that the things we do when we're four, five, six, seven years old, uh, if we're really passionate about them, can translate into uh, what we do in our uh, careers. Her uh, father, so father and mother, her mother was uh, a homemaker, but also a, um, a, um, a teacher. Uh, very educated, extremely smart. She taught speed reading. Uh, and she'd go through novels, you know, take her a day to read a, a thick novel. And she saw to it her children were exposed to art. They went to museums. And when they traveled to Europe, they went to all the cathedrals. And the nearest to them was the Chicago Art Institute. And they would get there regularly. Her father was an engineer, a chemical engineer, and an academic chair, and then a dean of engineering. And um, so she's, a, uh, and then she had these two brothers who were seven and nine years older. Uh, uh, David, who, um, um, and Gordon, and uh, they are both about what they look like. Uh, <laughs> David is uh, sitting in his laboratory, a pioneer in human genetics, and we kid him about uh, why he hasn't got his Nobel Prize yet. And uh, Gordon spent many years sitting, watching for Russian missiles coming over the North Pole. Um, um, uh, as an electronics engineer. And uh, the, every one of these people had incredibly high cues. Gordon's is just off the chart, can't be measured. And they were really competitive and really enjoyed um, how sharp they were. They played deadly competitive backgammon uh, and things like that. So in a way, Mimi was a very male-identified woman in that she had these very strong men uh, in her life, big brothers, you know, to, uh, to take care of her. and. Um, uh, a lot of women like that, turn, with that kind of background, turn out to be very strong in their professions because they sort of feel this, this, um, this support that's always, um, always with them. Um, Mimi's uh, parents took her everywhere uh, over the summers. What you did for summer vacation, if you were those kind of Midwestern people, is you piled in the car and uh, she had been in every state. I think there were two states she hadn't been to. Uh, she had been in, uh, you know, 46 of the continental um, 
continental states. And then when she was in the uh, equivalent of the 11th grade, her father had a uh, Fulbright or something like that, and they were off to Europe. And then they, after the summer, they just put her on a train and sent her off to the school in Switzerland. And after that, she's got the sense that she could handle anything <laughs> uh, because you know she's just totally on her own in Europe. In um, you know, which maybe a lot of you know, we have students now from all over the world who have you know gotten out of Bosnia or something like that at that age. So it's it's not so exceptional. But for an American in those days, it was quite exceptional. Uh, to be uh, uh, crossing Europe alone uh, at that age. And so it gave her a huge amount of confidence. And I think this kind of um, uh, the result was she was a very feminine, but also strong and independent. Uh, she was married and took her husband's name, but she was also an independent uh, professional. She was um, uh, into makeup and shopping, but she could also uh, live in the man's world and worked on designing the Grand Coulee Dam in uh, Breuer's office. She was short. Uh, soft-spoken and polite, but also had very strong, uh, very strong ideas. And all of that, I think, for a lot of young women students made her a, a very um, strong role model for them, that they could see this kind of independent uh, professional woman. She went to Middlebury, where she studied, um, and she chose Middlebury because they had a French dorm, and she had just gone to school in Switzerland, so she wanted to keep up speaking French and skiing. <laughs> and uh, in Switzerland, uh, Jim was uh, you know, climbing the mountain and then skiing down it every morning before breakfast. She'd always been a little bit heavy, and there were periods in her t life when the weight totally came off, and that was one of them uh, that year in Switzerland. So she, Middlebury was a place where you could speak French and ski. And she majored in art history and philosophy, but then when it became clear, and you know, from this background I describe of these father and brothers and even her mother, she was gonna become a professional. And when she decided on architecture, um, the university at that point, her family was living in Delaware, just a few minutes drive from Philadelphia actually, and uh, she transferred to, uh, to Penn. And the Penn that she went to was a, a wonderful place, she didn't have courses with Louis Kahn, but he was a, a, a tremendous presence there. Uh, lectured and you know visited a lot of the courses that she was in, and we all went to all of his juries. Uh, of an extremely interesting person, G. Holmes Perkins, put that school together. Uh, one of the more remarkable schools of modern architecture. Both Bob and Denise, uh, Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown were uh, professors of hers, and she was also very influenced by Edmund Bacon, who was this. A masterful city planning figure, and Bacon's probably more influential on her than anyone else because Bacon was a student of this non-Western material. How was Peking put to, or Beijing put together? How was um, uh, you know a student of all these uh, history of all these cities and how they worked, how they developed, what their morphologies were, what their dy dynamics were? in a very Hegelian sense. And so that really was an underpinning of, uh, of Mimi's thoughts. One of her projects in Bob Getty's studio was uh, a mental hospital that we did, and hers got published in Progressive Architecture magazine. So she was already uh, an achiever um, at that point. So these are the pages from um, PA. Mimi and I met at Penn, and um, um, she, she married the guy who had, uh, this is just a, a photograph a little bit later. Uh, the couple of things, if I could just, she died very quickly. And so I really knew what she wanted and it's not a problem. But the two questions I would ask her is one, where's the wedding album and what's the code to the Citibank bank account? Uh, <laughs> so I don't, have, um, I don't have any of our wedding pictures except this one that happened to be, I happened to have elsewhere. So I just took this picture from a little bit later. She, she married the guy at Penn who had the uh, flat abdomen, the, the, a lot of hair, black t-shirt, and drove BMW motorcycles. And um, uh, there, there's some people here who are f uh, former students of ours who recall these two professors rolling up to Pratt on an R69S and uh, pulling it into the gate and locking it up. So they thought that was really cool to have professors like that. And, um, but also, uh, noting of that time, um, the, um, every woman architect we can think of, Mimi's age or older, and two on our faculty, Nancy Miao and Barbara Nesky would be examples, married architects. 
And then the architects younger than me, me uh, no longer, shall we say, no longer felt that need. Uh, they, were, they were more free. But uh, Mimi lived at a time when she got registered, one and one quarter percent of the registered architects were women. So it was a really uh, pioneering time. And it's just an interesting phenomenon how um, uh, uh, she, the fact that she married an architect was not unusual. And um, occasionally women architects still do. But then everyone we can think of um, did. We uh, moved to New York. and. That was my idea. She could have stayed in Philadelphia. Philadelphia is already a pretty big city for her and very sophisticated. But I had grown up on Long Island and could not wait to get back to New York. And um, she worked in some interesting office. She worked for a firm called Kahn and Jacobs. It's no longer there under Durscott, whom uh, is a very strong, flamboyant Yale graduate, is this quality that Yaleys have. And he would just churn out these designs. Here's the Minkskopf power that he did. And uh, he really came to uh, really love and rely on Mimi because she was a really strong designer and could really you know, grind this stuff out. I mean, uh, at any time I talked to Durr, uh, he would say, um, if Mimi ever wants to work, I'll hire her again. He was you know, really impressed with her. And then she got enough confidence to go on to a, a really name office. Uh, and so she went to Marcel Breuer's and worked on some very interesting projects, including the extension to the Grand Coulee Dam, which was larger even than Russian dams. And the Russian dams were really big in those days. And so people could say to her, oh, you're an architect. You design houses? But people really said that then uh, to women. She, no, I'm designing the Grand Coulee Dam. Um, she um, worked for John Johansson, who's uh, still on our faculty, uh, on the housing on Roosevelt Island. And it was an extremely uh, sexy, interesting skip corridor design. I had worked on a skip corridor design, and I knew that it's about the hardest thing in terms of juggling space in your mind that you could imagine. And so um, Mimi actually came, went back Friday after everybody had left, an hour later, stole off the desk all the drawings from one of her associates, worked around the clock over the weekend, and designed the thing, which it never would have happened because these things are really complicated. And brought it in the next uh, Monday and says, here's how they work. And uh, that immediately got her, um, got her promoted into uh, doing serious work in that office as well. She um, passed all of her exams the first time around. Anybody who's taken the exams um, know how difficult that is without even taking a cram course. Uh, she just got all the books and studied. and. Um, um, and she was like that. We have a, a student, someone's actually here, who was going on to graduate school and was told, oh, you have to take the, um, what is it, the GRTs, graduate, G, graduate record exam or something like that. And she got really worried. Uh, it, it became apparent that this guy was just not into that kind of stuff. So she went to Barnes & Noble, bought a stack this high of books about the GRE, and got him over and just around the clock over the weekend drilled him, and you know he got into Yale. So she was uh, a very quick study in that sense. Around this time, um, the women were becoming uh, aware of themselves in every field, feminist movement in general, and then women in architecture as a thing. You know, women in architecture were identifying themselves in what I guess is called the second wave of the feminist, feminist movement, first one being, I guess, suffrage and et cetera, and second wave being the 60s. And so she worked on the archive of women in architecture and on, a, um, um, on the show that Susanna Torre did, Women in Architecture at Brooklyn Museum, and worked on starting a woman's office, which, which it became apparent that they weren't going to get along with each other. Uh, and et cetera. But um, she um, uh, was involved in all that. Again, when she, uh, when she became registered, again, just to think of this, 1.5% of registered architects were women. And now, you know, it's not like law school where it's 50 and 60% women, but at least women are almost 50% in architecture and certainly probably 30 or 40 percent of the people now taking the exams are, are um, women. In, uh, in this women in architecture movement, the, it was a really strong debate, which was, OK, what are we about? Do we, do we want 
to be led into the men's game, or do we stand for something different? And serious debate. In other words, are women just as good as and the same as men, or are women different from men and have something different from or to offer? And if you say that, then you're implying biology is destiny, which is what the second wave feminist movement was trying to get away from. So that was a really open debate, and Mimi very seriously came down on the side that women are different, uh, uh, ultimately, as she developed her own mind. Um, well, we get to New York in 1965, and it was, um, history's gonna have to look back on this as, and to use a phrase that uh, Tom did earlier, a very unique, <laughs> which is not grammatically correct, a very unique moment. And um, uh, otherwise known as sex and drugs and rock and roll and art. And uh, it was in psychedelics, in changes in consciousness. Does anybody not recognize Timothy Leary? Um, it was in politics. The war in Vietnam was heating up, and it was, we've got more used to war now since Vietnam and the desert storm and what's about to come up. But at the time, it was, you know, things were heating up, and it was very intense, uh, both in terms of war movements and peace movements. In uh, rock music, and this thing called rock and roll, or Buddy Holly, was evolving into something very heavy and very serious. Uh, Serious as literature in the case of Bob Dylan and uh, um, who did I look at love from both sides now? Joan, yeah, Jody Collins. Yeah, you know, so there was, you know, this really serious stuff and electronic music. I remember seeing a band. I said, you're going to replace your guitar with a computer? Uh, I mean, your drummer with a computer? I mean, it was, you know, really interesting things were happening. And then in uh, entertainment, this is Dionysius in 69 on the left and hair on the right, and in sex. And there were women walking down the street in totally transparent blouses and no bras. And I, Mimi understood that these things were cyclical. But I thought, you know, five more years, everybody's going to be walking around in nothing. Uh, and so uh, um, we were hanging out at the um, um, Architectural League. And that was our place. So here's the Architectural League, a show that I did there. And there's the two of us, the way we once looked, and <laughs> Jane Fonda hair. Could someone reach and just try to very fine focus that thing on the, on the top? Not the lens, but the top. Give that just a little turn. And uh, so we were at a, a party at the, I, got, I guess it's out of focus in the slide. Um, we were at a party, and Mimi is talking to some guy, and they're chatting away and away, and then all of a sudden he says, um, looks at her finger and sees a ring. And he says, oh, I see you're married. You've been wasting my time. <laughs> Again, this is totally typical of the times. So Mimi said, OK, it's time to redefine marriage. And uh, <laughs> so we took exotic drugs, had sex with all of our friends, got photographed, and wrote a book about it. And this is a book that just came out about that period, and we're a whole chapter in this book called Make Love Not War. And uh, to this day, there's an underground awareness at Pratt. I mean, each generation of students that comes in are told about these, these weird professors. <laughs> and and they'll, come up to, they'll come up to me and they'll say, did you write a book? <laughs> and uh, then they'll say, can I get a copy? <laughs> and then she'll say, no, you have to wait till you graduate. <laughs> and um, so when I had hair and Mimi, uh, <laughs> Mimi was thin, we were photographed by very prominent photographers and published in magazines all over. There's a full page on us in the New York Times, but not with these pictures. Uh, <laughs> but they were all over, and, and various of the friends that we were photographed with don't like their pictures shown anymore. They've, uh, you know, I was showing, someone called me up and said, I just heard you're showing my picture. <laughs> you know, it's like all these people did this in the 60s. I hope those pictures don't reappear. Um, the, uh, we saw our marriage as a, a kind of uh, spiritual path. And it was, in fact, we wrote a book that was never published called Marriage as a Spiritual Path, in which one dedicates oneself to the other totally. 
my spiritual path is to totally dedicate myself to Mimi, and vice versa. And so that that makes for a kind of a unique um, unity, which you might see in the Kala Chakra engaged uh, couple. And um, just a, a quick note that after many, many year, decades of quiet, uh, a few years ago Mimi said, I'm just tired of being old and fat. And, um, and so she um, uh, went out on numerous adventures, uh, one of which is symbolized right here. He might be here. And uh, some of her lovers might actually, I think, are in this room right now. And so she remained uh, extremely, uh, extremely active. Mimi came to Pratt in uh, 72, as Tom said, the second woman with full-time in tenure. She had this musing problem. She, the first time she was interviewed, they didn't hire her, because they asked her at the interview, uh, do you believe that uh, architectural drawing should be taught? And not wanting to, you know, knowing these were very unstructured times, she said, well, I think course should be available for those who want it. Well, that, no, no, that was it, wouldn't get hired. Because they, they were not going to teach drawing. So next year, she was careful, more careful in her interview and got hired. And um, she was hired on a, uh, typically, <laughs> as we still do today, hired on a Friday to start teaching on Monday. And so she really went through a weekend of, you know, like, what am I doing? You know, if I'm leaving the profession because I don't like it, why am, you know, and then I'm going to teach other people, you know, prepare other people to go into it, what am I doing? And so the first court course she t offered, a, it was a studio, it was, it was on, it was based on a concept she called architectural alternatives, other w things that architects could do. And they went and visited all kinds of interesting people. They went to Peter Eisenman to see, you know, theorists at an institute. They went to um, site to see people who were doing art, et cetera, et cetera. And that was one of the first courses she taught. Um, when, just to show she could do it, she taught life support systems for a while, comprehensive design studio, first year design studio, non-Western, and most recently, her courses were a lecture course, Myth and Symbol, and a design studio, which she calls Riding the Tiger, so I have one of her stuffed tigers outside, and some course outlines out there. Her um, uh, approach to teaching, and perhaps uh, we, um, we decided not to have children, so her, the students were, in a way, her children, the students and her cats, and um, uh, so she was very, very dedicated. She taught to each student as an individual and helping them reach into their inner creativity in very structured ways. Uh, the, all those things from the 60s of, of um, oh, I don't know, um, uh, guided imaginations and all kinds of uh, psychic exercises that were developed at that time, she would harness those that were appropriate to uh, the studio. She respected the students' cultures. And if you allow our students to actually talk, you'll find that a lot of them are, you know, are re into really weird things. I mean, just ask the New York Sanitation Department how many dead chickens are in the garbage on Monday. And uh, the, these, a lot of these people are our students, and, and they just don't talk about it. <laughs> and so Mimi created an environment where you could bring this into your out and, and make it part of your design work instead of like hiding uh, this part of yourself. Hang on while I flip my tape. Um, this is her. Uh, sh sh oh, she was really obsessive. And before computers, she would type up something like a course outline on the typewriter. And there would be one line, you know, like one word left over on a line. So she retyped the whole thing. You know, to, now you could just reformat it. So if these are her court, you know, what our course outlines look like, and they were really, really beautiful. Not, and it's not just you know the graphics, but uh, a real serious thought went into went into these. And here is Mimi with some of her um, students. She really worked hard to pull together big, you know, big and diverse juries for her students. Now, um, just around the time she started teaching, uh, she, she was thinking about it. She says, I don't want to live schizophrenically. I'm into architecture. I'm into sex. I'm into spirituality. I'm not going to live these three separate things. How do you pull them all together? And she ended up spending a weekend with a woman named Jan Clant, who's a Jungian analyst. And together, 
they designed a goddess temple. And this, no one was talking about this at the, at the time, but to bring together all the, psychological all the psychological principles of the feminine principle and then represent it architecturally. And so this really represented for her a bringing together, and you know, I should say sexier as erotic energy or psyche, she called it psyche eros, um, otherwise known as left brain, right brain. Uh, and so there's, um, um, Technilogos, which we would tech the technological and the rational, and psychieros, which is the um, uh, the holistic and the um, sensual, and bringing all that together in uh, into one thing, and it really then became the focus of her approach ever since. She did a lot of projects uh, just for herself uh, based on these ideas. This is a uh, the little beach house she did called the Vasta Purusha house based on uh, a whole set of principles uh, in Vasta Purusha Hindu ma um, uh, mandala. She got involved with a, a group of uh, women interested in the goddess. Uh, this was a magazine called Heresies, and it was a collective that, does, that did this goddess issue. And that group of people really were Mimi's friends and uh, colleagues for many years thereafter. And they, as a, as a group, got to know Maria Gambudis, who's the scholar pioneer um, in the field. Uh, they went all around to conferences, presented papers. Here they are in Malta at a conference on the, um, oh, the fertility goddess and Mediterranean, whatever, whatever. Uh, and they bump into their uh, Colin Renfrew, who's the dean of European archaeology, is the leading uh, European archaeologist. And she's in these big fights with him, telling him, this is the way it is. And she says, well, she's, well name the cultures. And she can't. She just runs through and names every culture. So he said, look, uh, I'm leading a whole group next year at the World Conference on Archaeology in Southampton. Why don't you come and give a paper on male bias paradigms in archaeology? So she came and put together, she put together a paper on male bias paradigms in archaeology, and she and her warrior women goddess friends all went off to the conference. And uh, she and I also got a chance to drive around and see Stonehenge and all that, um, all that ki kind of stuff. Um, and it, so it was very heady times, and it was also this real tension between what I, I like to call the political feminists and the spiritual feminists. And um, uh, I would have loved to have seen a panel discussion between, uh, say, um, what's her name? Anyway, the, the politically oriented feminists, but it, it, it never happened. Yeah, not, not the, no, the one who's the, no, Gloria Steinem, yeah. I went to, I went to, we went to a lecture by Gloria Steinem, and so I, I asked the following question. Uh, I said something about changes that have been going on, and I said, um, um, the, the, the spiritual feminists hold that women are, spiritually and psychically different from men. And the political feminists hold that they're the same. Now, I just used two words that Gloria Steinem does not recognize, spiritual and psychic. They're, they're just these, the, in other words, it would be hard to have a discussion because they don't even share a vocabulary. Uh, but um, Mimi had respect for them and you know, certainly felt that the battles that they fought were, were needed, but her own interest extended into these uh, other areas. Now, a lot of people have uh, seen Mimi's, I have them here, Tonkis, and little statues and stuff like that. And so what was Mimi's religion? And um, her parents, she, you know, her parents' church was Presbyterian, which they occasionally go to, you know, when they thought it was good for the children. Um, when she was a little girl, she and her friends got these books on world religions and, you know, like shopped and, ex and which one explored all of them. Um, we were married in a Unitarian church, but I would say the best described her position combines Buddhism, shamanism, and the goddess. And uh, in Buddhism, uh, a, a really depth sense of the, of the psyche. And she uh, was very serious about it, very good friends with the monk Lope Sang Sampton, studied extensively, uh, underwent the Kala Chakra initiation with the Dalai Lama, um, but she was not going to sit and meditate two hours a day. Uh, uh, shamanism was probably the closest to really what she felt, that you, 
you go into your imagination and you encounter these forces like your helper animal, which for her was a bear, so her bears are, are over there. And um, you see that shamanism is the fundamental human religion or spiritual system in all cultures going back to the caves of Lascaux. And, so, and, and she saw in shamanism an architecture, like for example, the three levels, which become the earth, the heaven, and hell, in, and, and then the layers in the, in the, of heaven and layers of hell is exactly like Dante. You can find all of Dante in shamanism. So shamanism lays down a mental architecture that then gets expressed in, um, in, um, in our culture. And then the goddess is a, uh, the recognition historically that during the Neolithic period, the central deity was this female figure, and that another term for it being the feminine principle, that there is something that uh, the female psyche brings to bear that's enriching to the, uh, to the earth. And um, so here are the, um, the goddess, whether it's um, 15,000 BC, and, the, and Mimi says this, this, she appreciated these because her body was of the Neolithic persuasion. Um, <laughs> this is a Pajma Paramita, and I'll mention this later, one of the most beautiful sculptures uh, ever. Uh, here is a Kala Chakra mandala. Here's Mimi presenting her design studio to the Dalai Lama where they did a cultural facility for Tibet. And this is Lobsang, who's our uh, very good friend and um, uh, the monk that uh, she uh, worked with. She even sponsored, she financed him being scholar in residence at the New York Open Center for a couple of years. Uh, these are shamanic images from the caves of Lascaux and we still have teddy bears and which brings this shamanic energy into ourselves today. And there's Mimi's personal little shamans. Uh, uh, this is her, as a, as a girl, her, their dog Pat. These are cats we had in the 60s, Jules and Jim, and Kathy did not get along with them, so Kathy found another home. Uh, and then um, Cindy and Charm, both of, all these cats, have, these other cats are way long since gone. These cats just died maybe five years ago. Um, but Charm was a gift from Arthur uh, Edwards, who was a um, uh, colleague of ours at Pratt and bred Abyssinians. And she was very uh, close to Charm. Uh, Mimi kept little, oh, in her wallets and, and little um, folders, and she put little pictures and stuff like that. And this is one of the ones she liked. And, and uh, herself as a child of the universe, she, um, she once said, I have, I have total faith in the universe. And I said, what if you get hit by a bus? And she said, all the molecules would be just fine. And when we were in the hospital, and the night that the doctor said, uh-oh, um, I left the room with the doctor, and he said, and we were, we were bubbling along, we were talking, we were chatting and everything, talking about this and that. And the doctor said, did that woman understand what I said? And I said, oh yeah, she's not afraid of dying. She's not interested in pain and suffering, but she has no problem with dying. And so she had this sense of this total um, interpenetration between herself and the universe was just was how she lived. And if you want to say what was her religion, I would say that's what I would say. Uh, she sort of expressed these ideas at the New York Open Center. She gave courses there and lectures, as well as other places, the Jung Foundation. So it was sort of her home for, uh, for these ideas. Now I want to talk about Mimi's approach to architecture just briefly. On the left is Newgrange Passage Mound, 3200 BC, and uh, a Neolithic um, structure. And what do we see? We enter into the mound. It's, you know, this is a plan. Enter the mound, and there's a cruciform shape. There's the Gothic cathedral of 1200 BC, 4,500 years earlier laid down. And so what she saw in this early architecture, just when the shamanism lays down the architecture of the mind, which then gets expressed in form in high cultures, in this early architecture that she was so interested in, this Neolithic architecture, is laid down the basic forms the seeds of all of the architecture of the high cultures. Uh, similarly, these are both pyramids that she climbed. Uh, here we are in Mexico. 
a stepped pyramid, temple on top, stairs on four sides. Here we are, Borobudur, Buddha Stupa in India, a step pyramid, temple on top, stairs on four sides. Not only that, you get to the bottom of the stair and there's a head of a snake, the mouth is open, and there's a man's head in it. You get to Campbell's mythology should develop a comparative approach to architecture. And whereas the post-structuralists held that rationalism is over and the world is inherently chaotic and unknowable, which is ultimately a nihilist position, even though they want to deny it, Mimi held that rationalism is a, is a small subset of a larger system. And that larger system is knowable by absorbing the patterns that you see in, um, in culture, and you get to know those patterns by being a student of all these cultures. By the way, uh, Orthodox academia handles the mystery of this by you're not allowed to be, if you're a Mexican specialist, you're not allowed to have anything to do with Borobudur and vice versa. That's how they handle it. You cannot comment or publish outside your specialty or you will not get tenure or you'll lose it. Uh, being at Pratt, where we're allowed to do anything, uh, and that was the wonderful thing about Pratt, that Mimi was well aware that nowhere else would she have been allowed to pursue these approaches. Um, that uh, she could look at all these cultures. And she mastered every one of them at a level just short of what the specialists in each field did. And through this, she saw this succession of patterns uh, in culture historically, the sensitive chaos of the hunter-gatherers uh, who did not make a permanent architecture but laid down this, this architecture of the mind, the Neolithic period of the early agricultural societies. Here are these temples. Maltese temples in about 3200 BC, and does that look familiar? There's the body of the Neolithic uh, goddess. The um, emergence of the four quarters, these are the Bronze Age warrior chieftains, the Greeks, and uh, the, it was mind blowing. We were in a bookstore and we found a, a book that had a plan of a Peruvian palace that was a Megaron. There are the four columns, there's the pot of fire, this is the exact plan of a Greek Megaron in Peru, um, because it's appearing at this period culturally. The pyramids were not just in Egypt, but were uh, representative of um, a certain stage in culture. Uh, Louis XIV was not the only sun king. Every emperor was a sun king, uh, and their empires had these, uh, these similar qualities. Um, and the, um, the post-industrial uh, commercial grid that we now live in today has existed before, and we can understand our culture more richly by studying this period in Rome and Peru. And then finally, uh, dissolution, which is the state of death of a culture, and can enrich us in, in understanding uh, our, how our own culture will die. She was interested in uh, this uh, uh, using the chakra system for levels of architecture on a level much more specific and fine-grained than firmness, commodity, and delight. And she gave her students this little nifty thing here, heroic architecture and oracular architecture. Or an architecture, um, a kind of aggressive heroic architecture that gets you in the magazines, and an architecture that comes out of the depth of your own honest exploration of your um, psyche. And finally, outside of architecture, um, uh, Mimi's mind would just, she would have preferred never to sleep. Um, you know, she would usually go to sleep if, you know, if school didn't force otherwise, she would be going to sleep maybe around 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'd get up at 7 and she'd just be, or 6 or 7, she'd just be starting to roll, you know, she's sitting at her computer, she's knocking out this stuff, she's having a ball, and she's, I don't want to go to bed. And we discovered that, you know, <laughs> between being grown up and not having any kids, you can do anything you want. So uh, it just was unbelievable. This is a book by John Narr called Living in One Room. This is a beautiful room she had in when we had a brownstone uh, in Manhattan, and it's just filled with, um, with her stuff. She was interested. Here's, uh, here's this color photographs of that room, and just all of these interests pasted, you know, to the... Um, to the walls. She played the harp 
And uh, it was just, you know, this music would waft through the apartment, and it was just the most beautiful and peaceful thing. She was fascinated with tarot, and she would do tarot readings for her students. And so tarot is a form of, just sort of a form of psychology. And, um, oh, by the way, um, this is the, she had maybe about 300 tarot decks, which I've given to a tarot organization. But um, the best tarot deck, the one she always went back to, uh, was the Rider Waite deck, which the illustrations were done by a Pratt student. And it was just coming up on the 100th anniversary a couple years ago, and she was trying to get Pratt to do an exhibit of, these, of, the, of this tarot work, since it was a Pratt student, and it had become such a big phenomenon. But she didn't get anywhere. But anyway, this is the work of a Pratt student here. Um, she was just fascinated with astronomy. She had a fine telescope, and she just totally understood it all. And she had sky charts, and we'd go to my parents' house in Connecticut, you know, where we'd get away from the city lights and go to the neighbor's lawn because they didn't have any trees. Uh, and we'd set up the telescope, and our nieces would come over, and we'd be spotting everything, and she'd, you know, know what it all was, and she had these charts on the wall in the bathroom to know what the sky was going to do each month. And, um, and it also was a student in, of uh, archaeoastronomy and was part of the organizations. This is a, a, an organization that studies the impact of, archae of astronomy on old cultures, such as Stonehenge is aligned to various stuff. And so she was into that, knew all the, all the main people in that field. She was in, avidly into rubber stamps. She had over 3,000 rubber stamps and several hundred of her own that she had made. Uh, she would just carve them out of uh, erasers uh, and uh, make these really nifty, um, nifty rubber stamps. And then she was just incredibly into needlework. And it's, it's just a field that we know uh, is of interest to a lot of women, but I think it's, it's totally under studied, were under aware of it. And I read this, we were driving across the country, wherever we, we were, she's just avidly interested in anything. So we're in Kansas where there's nothing, because it's, 100 and it's 110 and the wind is blowing. So you can't, anything gets flattened. There are no trees because they can't survive the climate. So the pioneers there lived in sod houses. So we go to the museum of the sod house and you just dig into the ground to live. And the fence posts are made out of stone with barbed wire then strung on them but the, because there's no wood. They make stone fence posts. So we're going to the local, you know, local museums of the area and uh, the historical society and getting all these books on stone fence posts. And, um, and so this just endless avid um, interest in everything. And one of the books we picked up when we got to Indian country was about the biography of some woman who was an important weaver. And their culture was that they were, girls were not allowed to touch the loom until they were, whatever, nine years old or something like that. So this girl just sat in back of the loom watching her mother's fingers flying, you know, tying the knots as she's weaving these Navajo rugs. And the moment she was allowed to touch a loom, she was a Mozart. I mean, this is, rugs just went flying out, and she's one of the great Navajo artists, and her stuff's very collectible. And so there's something about the mind, you know, knit to, pearl to, whatever it is, and made me just churn out these complex sweaters and these, all these clothes and everything. So we have, have a couple of mini storages with stuff, but uh, they're just bags and bags of her needlework um, that she would do. And, and for years she made, not later, but for many years in, early in our marriage, she, she made a lot of her own clothes. And I just happened to have one, this one piece lying around the apartment, so it's on the wall outside, um, this piece here. And just something, she was just pulling around, and she made this beautiful little uh, woman sitting at a... Um, in front of a book, and here's just a little photograph I found in our collections of, uh, of some yarn. So where does Mimi leave us? And um, um, she produced a remarkable book on that stuff I was talking about, about those special archetypes. It's pretty much finished, but it just needs the illustrations, et cetera. So it, that's my job, is to finish it. Um, her papers are going to go to the International Archive of Women in Architecture, and they are delighted to get this, something this complete, because we've got all of her school projects and her notes from her classes at school and her course outlines from, you know, when she, I don't have everything, but a lot of it, when she started at Pratt, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this rich trove of material that I'm putting together for them. And then Pratt very generously, um, not Pratt generally, but the 
the three deans in architecture, uh, gave her uh, her own room, room 210 upstairs, in which she had hoped to build a whole study center and would have a library of books and you know coffee pot and, and she would spend time there with her students and so the stuff was there but she had never got finished getting it put together but um, this is a little emblem she made for that for that room and uh, Chickering has been generous enough to uh, help me um, uh, arrange the movement of a lot of her books, I'm keeping some, which we'll give later because it's some I need for stuff I'm doing, uh, to the Pratt Library. And so I made this little book plate, which this is just my sketch. It's going to go to a designer to be done nice. So this will be in every book. Uh, plus, you could go to the card catalog and just say Mimi's books, and you'll get the whole list. Or um, Because we're not in a position to have their, have their own room. They're going to be integrated into the collection, but they'll be identified by this plate. And it was interesting. I chose uh, Michelangelo's Libyan Sybil for the plate, and the choices between that and Pajma Paramita, and this was, these are two of her favorite works of art. And this one's a woman in non-Western, and uh, this is a woman, but we know that Michelangelo used male models to do his women and just sort of stuck breasts on them. So which to choose to represent her femininity? But she just found this so beautiful, and she had the, uh, uh, little postcards of this in so many of her wallets and everything. And it do, really did represent uh, strongly, you know, this sense of the books and everything. So I gave about 300 of her books to the library at Tibet House, and they're going to um, get this one uh, in the book plate. So, so we'll have both of them. But it's interesting. If you look at this closely sometime, uh, she considered this the greatest work of non-Western art. And in and, and the, and the West, we have the sense of character and the individual. And in the East, there's a sense of transcendence um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the character. Now, I'm going to show some slides of Mimi, but just to end my talk, I just want to say that one of her favorite comic books is Asterix. There are two European comics that are really, really fantastic. She loved both of them, Tintin and Asterix. And Asterix is about a Gaulish village that has resisted conquest by the Romans and are continued thorn in the side. And, and each, each comic book, is about 20 of them, they have some adventure where they have to beat up the Romans. And uh, the hero is this little guy, Asterix, where is he? Uh, bottom one. Bottom yeah, here we go. Here's Asterix, who's our hero. His buddy is Obelisk. Obelisk is, is a men here a men here delivery man. A men here is the stones that uh, Stonehenge is made out of, and uh, and then he's got he's got this cute little dog, and they go off and they bop the Romans. Uh, but every comic begins with the village is in total turmoil, where you know you're selling me rotten fish and you know et cetera et cetera et cetera, and um, so Mimi was uh, had her frictions with our colleagues. Uh, like all of us do, and she thought of it as the turmoil uh, that you would expect of this village. All the disappointments that she suffered at Pratt that many of us have, and the conflicts, etc. Her father was, a, was an academic her whole life. He was first a professor, and then a chair, and then a dean, and then even when he retired, uh, he went and was a dean, uh, taught abroad for, for several years. And so, um, Nothing, everything that happened at Pratt that wasn't good happened a lot worse to our father. She says, I grew up in academia, I know all about it, this, that's the way it is. She, so ultimately she'd get over it. And so uh, when she was in conflict with her colleagues, she thought of it like it was still her village. And after the conflict, they all get together at the big banquet table, um, um, uh, and it's still our village, and we've defeated the Romans. And now what I'd like to do for just a minute is just go through a few slides and play a favorite piece of Mimi's music. So I uh, engage our primitive sound system here.
uh, my remark will be, that was incredible, and let's do it again in lots of future lives. Could, could somebody hit the top buttons on the light switch back there? And um, I considered Mimi to belong to uh, everybody, so let's uh, uh, assume that applause is for each other. And let me invite anyone who would like to um, come and say something. Uh, now, the type switches, could you pull the dimmer down about halfway so we don't bake under the lights? Uh, on all the lights. Make sure the dimmers are down about halfway. So can I invite anyone to come up who would like to say something? Microphone's here. My name is Bice Wilson. I came to Pratt as the, in the same year that Mimi uh, came here, and John and Mimi were colleagues of mine throughout my time here as a student uh, in looking at the restructuring of this school. Mimi was very joyful and courageous and committed in everything she did. She fought for her tenure. She was dissed. She was harassed. She was kicked out. She went through all of that, and the whole time, she would smile, and she would keep fighting. And she stood for her convictions and managed through the whole thing to be joyful and to be loving. And she stayed here, and she built this place. She built, she was a builder of people and of, of this place, and she contributed greatly to it. She changed my life. I am an archaeoastronomer, I'm an architect. She opened up in me, as she did in so many other students, the expectation that spirit could be present in place, that the cultures of our ancestors had wisdoms that we had long forgotten, and that in knowing those cultures and rebuilding those cultures and continuing their thought, we could find the spirit that had left architecture so long ago. I'm tremendously saddened that she's no longer here. I'm deeply, deeply honored to be here among all of you today. And um, she's a great, great woman. And I have to say that, John, um, the two of you, as much as you pursued your own lives, your loving commitment to each other, uh, and the symbiosis that you were and are, was always very beautiful and very inspiring and will always be that way. Thank you. I'm Donald Crumley, I uh, teach here, and I first met um, John and Mimi on a ride from Penn, where we were, where we were all at school, to, uh, to New York. That was in either 1962 or 63. Um, and our lives crossed many times. We met at the Architectural League. Um, where John and Mimi had a lot of activities. And I just want to add one detail about a period where I knew Mimi as her employer. Um, I was a associate, a design associate and job captain at uh, Marcel Breuer's office when she came to work there. And she worked on, <coughs> I think, two projects, if I recall. I think the 
Cleveland Museum and the notorious Grand Central Project. Uh, this was before she worked on the dam. Um, and I was extremely impressed with her. She was, um, she was the, the most excellent person in the office because she was extremely thorough. Uh, she would take on any task that I asked her to do and it was completed with amazing uh, clarity. Uh, it was the clarity that I remembered the most. And I was so impressed by that, that when I had my own office, and uh, that is when I was able to hire, and when I had my own office, I still had my own office. Um, and I found out that she was not working. I persuaded her to come work for me for about a year and a half, two years. And I would ask her to do these very strange things. Uh, I know that she, she would look at me sort of funny and pull out this box of drawing equipment, which is the tiniest drawing equipment I've ever seen in my life. I mean, she had a French curve that was that big. I've never, I've never seen, and she drew like a whiz bang. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And she was just as thorough and just um, as serious with me as she was with Breuer. Um, but I knew that she thought that I was out of my mind. I knew that, that some of the things that I said, well, Mimi, let's just try it. And she sort of looked at me funny, and then she'd dive in and do it, uh, and, go, and go further than I ever imagined. But she got back at me. She got back, back at me because in 1979, she drugged me here, kicking and screaming. Hi, my name is Christina Biaggi, and uh, I'm uh, an artist and a writer, and I was, uh, I'm, I was, Mimi was a very, very close and beloved friend of mine. I've known her since uh, the 70s when we were in a goddess group together, and we went to Malta together, and um, she, uh, she and I collaborated on, a, on, on the, the plans for a goddess temple that I still, I'm, I'm you know, determined to, uh, see built at one point and dedicate to her and also to Maria Gimbutas. And um, I, I enjoyed Mimi in every sense of the word. She was just a wonderful person and, and, uh, um, and that's all. And I, I miss her terribly. Thank you. John Lobel's sister, and it's taking a lot of courage for me to come up here because I'm going to bring up current events into this particular memorial, and I'd like to read a poem I wrote. This poem is called Wilderness Faces. I've seen vast tundras of snow, pine lined, reflected shadows on ice lakes, a frozen ocean. I remember sands of Israel strewn with rusty carcasses of old tanks, a memoriam against a blue sky. I've dreamt of jungle rivers, curved flow through green breathing light, the bird call and animal cries. I've seen gray mountain stone sides, risen rocks, testifying time with forests in their deep valleys. I've seen your face, lined with age, each cavern a monument to another loved one gone. Our own blue river, lined with steel mountains, the tower carcasses strewn against the sky, echo cries of human sorrow. The blue river carries a vast ferry of souls, ascend to the fiery glow of our beloved's embrace. I didn't know the wilderness was war. Well, I tell you, if Mimi's there to greet those people, they're going to have a wonderful time, and they're going to experience a lot of love. Thank you very much. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Michael Lipoy. Um, I graduated in 95. And uh, <clears throat> John didn't mention my name, but I was that student that uh, refused to study the DRE books. And so Mimi graciously helped me out um, over several nights. Um, and then I got into Yale. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm one of those, I'm actually uh, uh, one of those students that took several, several years to get out of Pratt. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm one of them. Um, Anthony was actually maybe two years ahead of me. So it took me about 11 years to get through, um, thanks to Mimi. I met her in 94. And uh, she, to me, she was that person that really opened the door for me. My creativity um, helped me um, pursue further uh, intellectual, you know, pursuits, and um, and we became uh, very close friends. I could call up Mimi at two in the morning um, and talk about um, some girl I was interested in, you know, w whatever. We talk about anything, and she'd do the same for me. Um, she's told me things. Um, maybe some of you don't know. But uh, just to an example, Mimi, Mimi proposed to John, not on one occasion, but two occasions, which is, to me, very unbelievable, the type of woman she is. Um, I miss her really dearly, and I spoke with her maybe a month before she passed away. And she said she was afraid, but by the end of the conversation, we, we were laughing and, and you know, talking about people, as we usually do, and, and just chatting away. So those are my memories of Mimi. Thank you. up on, on something that Bill was, by the way, the tapes are audio tapes of interviews that uh, Bill was doing of all faculty members. Um, uh, you know, a lot of women are concerned about getting older. And um, I, I never met anyone less concerned. We were in Bali just a few years ago. And <laughs> it was 35 women and two men. It was a, um, it was a, um, uh, Dakini retreat. It was it was a, a Buddhist uh, female deities re retreat, and a lot of these women were talking about this one woman, and a lot of were running, you know, like swimming naked and stuff like that. And this one woman was just incredible, 
And um, we're sitting around, this woman starts to cry. She says, why do I hate myself so much? Why am I putting this fat on? Why do I destroy myself? And I'm looking, I said, what is this woman's problem? And every woman there was having, you know, except Mimi. She says, I don't know, I love my body. <laughs> and um, when, when she got gray hair, she got, these, um, she got these little hexagonal granny glasses, and she says, I'm just going into my Margaret Mead mode. <laughs> but I'm sure there are a lot more people who want to say things, so please um, attribute. Okay, um, if the people standing over there could pull the um, tablecloths off, we have cookies and Cokes. Um, if someone could turn up those light switches just a touch. Uh, there are people here, most people here are from Pratt, but there are people here from other aspects of Mimi's life and lives. And if some of you would like to introduce yourselves to each other, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, and as I said, there are some of Mimi's little um, spiritual things are on both of these tables. If you have any questions about them, please ask. And please, if you have any comments, there's a book out back. You can um, make some notes.